How's it going guys? We have an ECG presentation, high yield stuff for you, similarly not going to hold your hand through first tier med school nonsense about what is a P wave, uh, what is a T wave, etc. This is your simile, okay? You gotta know some stuff that's just consolidated for the exam. Don't need your fucking hand holding right now. So after that uh, unnecessary preface, why don't we just start the presentation? How does that sound? So atrial fibrillation, classically irregularly irregular rhythm. When you look at the QRSs here, okay, they appear to be random distances apart, and you also don't see any P waves, okay? So the two things you're going to see is this random distancing, irregular, irregular rhythm for the caresses, and no P waves. Okay, could have written that down, but didn't matter. I told you. So, the high yield thing about atrial fibrillation for you, similarly apart from the ECG, is that the stasis within the left atrium due to the turbulence of blood, uh, or stasis slash turbulence of blood within the left atrium, can cause a mural thrombus that can launch off to different parts of the body. The brain slash eye stroke. TIA retinal artery occlusion can go to the SMA IMA, cause acute mesoteric ischemia. You can go to the legs, acute limb ischemia. Okay, so they love this stuff for you, Osimile. Of course, if it's acute limb ischemia, it's going to be popliteals slash femorals. And a classic scenario could just be a patient over the age of 70, okay, who's had a, a stroke TIA retinal artery occlusion and has normal blood pressure. I talked about in one of the other presentations I did how carotid stenosis is going to be the cause of stroke TIA retinal artery occlusion in a patient who has high blood pressure, all right, because you're going to get atheromatous development in the carotid, uh, common carotid, and that'll launch off. But if a patient has normal blood pressure, if they explicate that, they're trying to tell you it's not carotid stenosis, that would be atrial fib with a mural thrombus launching off instead. So AF is usually paroxysmal, meaning it comes and goes. So they can tell you, for example, that a uh, 77 year old dude, I wrote here 73, doesn't fucking matter. Uh, a dude generally over the age of 70, he might have had a TIA and they'll tell you the blood pressure is normal. ECG shows sinus rhythm, no abnormalities. But what's going to happen is he's going to go home, have dinner, switch an atrial fibrillation for 30 minutes, switch out of it. So what they like to do is if the ECG is normal, you're going to do a 24 hour ambulatory ECG monitor called a Holter monitor, and then you're going to pick up that paroxysmal AF. Okay, and uh, they want you to know once you diagnose the AF, the next best step is echocardiography because you can visualize left atrial mural thrombus in that setting if the patient's had a stroke, TIA, retinal artery occlusion. So, a few points here, as I mentioned briefly before, is that if you have a severe abdominal pain in the setting of AF, that's going to be uh, a mural thrombus that's launched off to the SMA or IMA, okay? It's a long discussion as far as mesenteric ischemia is concerned, acute versus chronic, etc. I talk about this stuff in my GI uh, PDF and also my other YouTube clips, but are they wanting to know mesenteric angiography? That's going to be the next best step. It's pain out of proportion to the physical exam, okay? So if they tell you someone has atrial fibrillation, has severe abdominal pain, then they do the physical exam and there's nothing eventful, they want you to know the next best step, just mesoteric angiography. You're looking for uh, a thrombus that's launched off. Okay, and there is a question on one of the two CKNVMEs where they give you an unstable patient in the setting and they just want laparotomy. Acute limb ischemia, likewise, if the mural thrombus has launched off to a popliteal or femoral artery. And so you, you can do embolectomy is the answer for that. So AF has many etiologies as to what can cause it, just general ischemia as patients get over. 8% of the U.S. population over the age of 70 has atrial fibrillation, okay? So structural abnormalities, hypertrophy, growth hormone, anabolic steroid use where the, the heart can change in size. Prior MI, fibrosis, you're uh, fucking with the electrical conduction system of the heart. It can all lead to AF. Okay, so I know some of you are staying for step one, but you obviously need to ace your 2CK eventually. Relax, okay? But this is exceedingly high yield. I'm just going to briefly cover this. Uh, for you guys doing 2CK3, which CHAD score is how you're going to determine whether you give antiplatelet therapy, i.e. aspirin or anticoagulation, which is going to be warfarin on USMLE. Now, there's variations to the CHAD score. It's to my observation, students get emotional about CHADs too vast, CHADs, etc. Uh, depending on which institution you happen to have trained at, gone to school at, I can tell you as per my observation across NBME exams, the CHAD, simple CHADs too suffices. So you get a point for each of these, congestive heart failure, hypertension, age 75 or greater, diabetes. 
And then the S is stroke, TIA, or embolic phenomena, which is two points. If you have zero or one points, you get aspirin on the NBME slash USMLE. It's two or more points, you get warfarin. There are other agents that can be used, the NOAX, the novel oral anticoagulants, such as a Pixaban, okay, the Bigatran, but I haven't seen USMLE go down that route. They tend to be old school and just give warfarin if you need anticoagulation. So, and I just want to make a note that uh, there's a question, for instance, on one of the 2CK forms where they tell you a patient had acute limb ischemia, okay? I believe it was acute, yeah, acute limb ischemia. And uh, the answer was just warfarin because that qualifies as the two points. Because I, I make note of this because the S in CHADS usually refers to stroke or TIA, two points, automatic warfarin. But it can also refer to if you've had uh, SMA, IMA, acute mystery ischemia or acute limb ischemia to the popliteal ephemeral, you're also mandatory just anticoagulation at that point with warfarin. As I just said, some students get emotional about using Melox uh, for, you know, for non-valvular AF versus warfarin. Classically, it's always for valvular AF. Doesn't fucking matter for USMLE, okay? They're just going to be old school and they'll, they'll use warfarin because it's not debatable. It's, it's definitely acceptable for the overwhelming majority of patients. And then just some other points that when we're talking about managing the actual AF itself, apart from the blood thinning, we can give a beta blocker first for usually metoprolol for rate control. If patients fail rate control or there's certain contraindications, we can go to rhythm control. Flocainide happens to be a drug, uh, type 1C uh, sodium channel blocker, antiarrhythmic, that can be used if patients have no structural or coronary artery disease. It's a lot of nonsense detail because we're talking about USMLE here. We're not talking about some bullshit, uh, obscure general med course, okay? I mean, what's actually gonna get you points in the exam? But I'm just telling you, you can be peripherally aware as your basic knowledge that apart from aspirin versus warfarin for CHADS2, you say, well, what else are we gonna do for AF? You just say, usually beta blocker first, rate control before rhythm control. If it doesn't work, we can't use it. Uh, we can use flocainide, okay? One of the antiarrhythmics. And then you should just be aware that Cardioversion is what you're going to do if a patient is unstable or has a, an extremely high heart rate, which can be called rapid ventricular response. Cardioversion, uh, sorry, un instability means your blood pressure is low, okay? Or if you have a coma in the setting of an arrhythmia, such as AF, you're going to do electrical cardioversion. They can also write the answer as direct current countershock. Atrial flutter, okay, you should just know what this ECG looks like. It's a sawtooth appearance. It's actually pretty low yield for USMLE. I think there's like one question it's mentioned, but if I don't mention it in a general ECG question, uh, ECG presentation, it's sort of an elephant in the room because a lot of you guys have heard of it. Doing one slide on it, that's it, okay? They could give you uh, this ECG here. You're like, oh, that's the sawtooth, that's atrial flutter, and then the answer is just super ventricular, okay, as to where it originates, okay? So... Now we talk about su supraventricular tachycardia versus ventricular tachycardia. This is really high yield for you assimilate. So they want you to know supraventricular tachycardia has needle-shaped complexes. Okay, they're narrow. So the QRSs, QRS complexes should be 80 to 120 milliseconds. So here they're just under the 120 milliseconds. They, you don't have to be an expert at ECGs, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at this ECG here and say, well, yeah, it looks needle-shaped. Okay, well, that's going to be SVT then if we're forced to choose. It's clearly not VT, which I'll go to next. Okay, so they really like the treatment for SVT on USMLE, which is going to be vagal maneuvers, aka carotid massage. There's a pediatrics question floating around where you can do ice pack to the face. And then if that fails, the vagal maneuvers slash uh, carotid massage, then you can go to adenosine, okay, which apparently stops the heart for like a few seconds and then heart starts again and your SVT is gone, right? It doesn't matter. Just you know, you just know that you're going to give adenosine as the next step. Don't confuse with amiodarone, okay? Because it can sound similar. And then I put a spacing between these two here because I just really want you to see the dichotomy that you've got medications on top for what you do when you have a stable SVT, meaning the patient has normal blood pressure, there's no coma. They really like that sequence of management as I just talked about. But then below here, if the patient has coma or low blood pressure, hemodynamic instability, you're going to go straight to direct current countershock slash cardioversion. They want you to know that. And for VT, as I said, contrasting, you see how these EC, they're wide complex, okay? They're not needle shaped. You see how they look like mountains? Okay, you don't have to be an ECG expert, okay? So when we look at the, the SVT here, the needle shaped, 
And then you look at the VT here and they look like mountains. You say, no idea what I'm fucking looking at. And I say, well, do they look wide to you or do they look narrow? If you just had to guess, do they look wide or narrow? You say, well, I guess they look wide. You're right, they're wide, okay? And the answer is just ventricle if you're, if you're asked where they originate from. Okay, antiarrhythmics, amiodarone can be used for treatment. So that whole sequence about vagal maneuvers, all that, that's SVT, that's not VT. And then likewise, whether it's SVT, VT, AF, when you have many arrhythmias where you have hemodynamic instability, you do direct current countershock, okay, or cardioversion. Okay, so premature ventricular complexes, you just need to know what these look like on an ECG, and you need to know you're just going to choose ventricle. So you're going to get this ECG on the USMLE, you're going to have no idea what you're looking at, you say no fucking clue. But if we were to look at this, you say, well, look at the abnormal part of the ECG. What's the abnormal part? It's this wide appearing complex, right? Well, you know that wide means ventricular, as we just talked about. So you've got this ventricular complex here. And if we had to just guess by looking at the pattern of when this complex should have occurred, it should have occurred a little bit later, right? So that these e e uh, QRSs are the same distance apart. So it occurred a little bit early, prematurely, and it's wide. So it's a premature ventricular complex, and the answer is just ventricle. Okay, obviously superventricular would be wrong, or atria would be wrong. And you don't have to treat them for you Okay, so STEMI. So you're going to have ST elevations in three to four contiguously. It's myocardial infarction. I've never seen non-STEMI assessed on USMLE. Okay, so uh, in fear, am I? This is past level stuff here. So you just need to know that if you have ST elevations and leads two, three AVF, that's inferior diaphragmatic surface of the heart. Okay, and that this will be the PDA, posterior descending artery, and in most people, that uh, because most people are right dominant, that's going to be the right coronary artery. So the answer can be RCA, right coronary artery. Or it can just be PDA straight up. So the dominant circulation refers to whether it's the left or right main coronary that the PDA comes off of. So in people, in most people, as I just fucking said, it's going to be RCA. And if people have a left dominant circulation, the order they want is uh, the left coronary goes to the left circumflex, goes to the PDA. And this shows up on one of the NBME exams, this exact sequence for step one. And students miss the forest for the trees. You're actually not expected to be uh, an anatomy expert where you just happen to have known the sequence. That's not really the case. It's big picture concepts. They tell you the patient's left dominant. So if you're choosing the sequence here, you're obviously not going to start with the right main coronary. Okay, let's start with the left. And then if you know the PDA is the vessel that's supplying the diaphragmatic surface, the inferior surface of the heart, that means you're going to end with the PDA. So it's just sort of coincidental that the left circumflex is in the middle there. Okay, so you wouldn't end with the left circumflex, you'd end with the PDA. Anterior slash apical MIs, okay, so you're going to have uh, ST elevations in the anterior leads. So uh, if they just show you this ECG, okay, literally just V1 through V3, sometimes uh, V4, and that's the left anterior descending artery. So the apex of the heart uh, is going to be the left anterior descending artery, the LAD. That can be confused with the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. So when you say, well, what vessel supplies the inferior heart, the diaphragmatic surface? That's the PDA. Which vessel supplies the apex? Well, that's kind of further down, right? So you think, oh, that's inferior. It's not. That's LAD. So apex is LAD, and it's classically an anterior infarct. Okay, so the, the left lateral heart is the left circumflex, so those are ST elevations and leads V4 through V6, classically. And then a posterior MI. I'm just letting you know that this exists. Uh, this is how you get like a 280, essentially, on step two, is if you're aware that ST depressions, the, the reciprocal ST depressions in the anterior leads, it's like ST elevations coming out the back rather than the chest. Okay, so you're just seeing the reciprocal uh, electrical conduction of that, but those are essentially, a, that's a posterior MI, okay, as just ST elevations out the back instead. So uh, I talked about this in my other presentation, but it's really high yield. There's just some general points about MI I want to make here apart from ECGs for the moment, but I'm going to come back. It's just that a post MI papillary muscle rupture, exceedingly high yield. If they say there's a new onset systolic murmur, four on six systolic murmur, hours to days after an MI, the time frame doesn't matter. That's papillary muscle rupture, okay, with dyspnea, mitral regurgitation. Stroke-like presentation after an MI, that's going to be an embolus from ventricular, sept uh, embolus from ventricular septal aneurysm, 
Okay, it's on one of the 2CK forms. Just know that that's possible. You say, why the fuck is this patient having a stroke like two days after an MI? That's like a little bit weird. Well, you can, you can technically get this occurring. Now, most common cause of death due to MI is ventricular fibrillation. They like that. So it's just you literally have complete disorganization of the electrical conduction. Now, so, so that's a factoid. They give you a patient who has an MI. What's the most common cause of death? Ventricular fibrillation. Patient has a pulmonary embolism. What's the most common cause of death? Ventricular fibrillation due to acute right heart strain. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, sudden death in young athlete on the soccer field. What's the most common cause of death? Ventricular fibrillation due to acute left heart strain, okay, due to uh, impaired left ventricular outflow. Now, fibrosis of the myocardium post MI can lead to uh, various arrhythmias as a sequela, okay? It doesn't matter which arrhythmia. It doesn't matter whether it's AF, SVT, it doesn't matter, okay? If you have fibrosis, doesn't it make sense? You'll have abnormal electrical conduction. So just uh, coagulative necrosis, just be aware. I'm throwing in this path point here, staying for step one. And then you should just know that cardiogenic shock, decreased cardiac output, increased peripheral vascular resistance, and increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. I talked about this stuff in my PDFs, and I also did another presentation on all this, but uh, high PCWP is what tells you you have cardiogenic shock. It's exceedingly high yield of a point. And then you need to know that if you get oliguria post-MI, that that is acute tubular necrosis, not pre-renal, okay, which is very difficult. If you, if you don't know renal well yet, you can go through my high yield renal PDF. I talk about this stuff because um, you're going to say, I don't get it. If you have acute drop in blood pressure, if the heart's not pumping, okay, you have cardiogenic shock and the kidney's not getting perfused, how is that not pre-renal? Because it's decreased perfusion of the kidney. But in the acute setting, okay, if you have an episode of ventricular fibrillation, if you have an acute MI, if you have acute blood loss during surgery, exsanguination, there's a gunshot wound, and then you get oliguria, that's acute tubular necrosis, not pre-renal. Pre-renal tends to be more subacute, NSAIDs, diuretic use, ongoing congestive heart failure, dehydration, vomiting over many days. Those tend to be the ideologies for pre-renal as opposed to just acute blood loss uh, or MI arrhythmia. Then for MI, they want aspirin first. Okay, that's your first treatment. Paramedics arrive. You're going to give dual antiplatelet therapy by adding clopidogrel, AD, uh, ADP 2Y12 receptor blocker. And then just a 2CK point, you just got to know that there's a qu acute coronary syndrome means unstable angina or MI. And you just got to know that um, they want cardiac catheterization. I don't really know what to tell you. I actually didn't talk about angina. Uh, angina pectoris in this presentation, but you should know that angina pectoris ischemia to the myocardium, not full on MI, is going to be ST depressions classically, okay? And then prismatol angina, which is going to be vasospasm, that will cause ST elevations. I didn't talk about in this presentation, but I'm just letting you know that's good information. Okay, so I'm just, I'm also just communicating that uh, when we get, if we want to get very technical about, well, how do you treat MI? Give me all the deets, give me all the details, right? I've never seen US only give a fuck about, you know, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, like all these other treatments, okay? They really don't go into detail about that stuff. It's just the aspirin plus clopidogrel that you got to know is dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and then a factoid you could be aware of is that if you have a right-sided MI, that nitrates are contraindicated, okay? So their volume, uh, right side MIs are volume dependent, and so you don't want to drop preload too much. And then I'm just, I said they don't obsess over the management such as PCI, but I'm telling you as a baseline that in theory that you can do interventional management within 90 minutes of, 90 minutes of reaching the hospital. Pericarditis exceedingly high yield for you, similarly clearly, and rather than uh, ST elevations in three to four contiguous leads as, as with a STEMI, you're going to have ST elevations diffusely and sometimes PR depressions, but I haven't seen you explain give a fuck about the latter. They actually don't even care that you're able to look at this ECG and know it's pericarditis. The ECG is pretty low yield. It can show up, but it's low yield. It's verbally, you got to know that diffuse ST elevations, they say that in the vignette. Pain that's worse when lying back, better when leaning forward. And then serious pericarditis can be post-viral. All right, autoimmune disease, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, cocaine use. These are high yield cause of pericarditis. Uh, and then there's an, there's an NBME question where they just ask straight up in terms of organisms, answers virus. Okay, so once again, autoimmune diseases. Don't think it's weird if you, if you get a friction rub or if you get pain 
that's worse when lying back than when leaning forward. And all they say is it's a 34 year old woman with rheumatoid arthritis. And you're like, well, where does the pericarditis come from? It's just autoimmune disease. It's not a big deal. And then the cocaine, right? So the, they'll give you 22 year old male after a night of heavy partying. That's just pericarditis. And then be aware that renal failure can cause pericarditis. So you remic pericarditis and they'll just want, they'll give you super high BUN and creatinine and then uh, friction rub and the answer is just hemodialysis. Okay, because you, you get that vignette and then I ask the student, why is there friction rub though? Like why? And it's just uremic pericarditis. Okay, so uh, post MI, you can get uh, fibrinous pericarditis right away, just within like days. That's called post MI pericarditis. And then you can also get another type uh, two to six weeks later called Dresler syndrome. It's antibody mediated. Dresler syndrome, ultra low yield. I don't think I've ever seen it assessed, but I got to mention it because students get hysterical. Okay. Um, but you got to know that they can just say four days after an MI, a guy has a friction rub Y, and that's just uh, fibrinous pericarditis. That's a lengthy discussion, okay? I mean, sometimes friction rub can be pericardial effusion, but based on the vignette, you, you would have to decipher that. So ECG, first step in diagnosis pericarditis, as we just went through, and then uh, after you diagnose it, a 2CK detail they want is you're going to do an echo after to visualize a potential concomitant uh, pericardial effusion. Okay, sometimes you get effusion secondary. And yeah, so once again, th they can be difficult with it where they give you pericarditis and you're like looking for ECG as the answer. It's not there and they just want echo. So you're going to treat this similar. I, sh I wrote same as acute gout. I'll, I'll be, some of you going to get very pedantic, but it's very similar to acute gout. Okay, like NSAIDs, indomethacin, colchicine, steroids. This is generally how we uh, treat acute pericarditis. Okay, so chronic constrictive pericarditis uh, doesn't present with the standard pain findings, but it shows up two ways. You got to know tuberculosis, the most common cause, can cause calcification around the heart. And then chronic constrictive pericarditis, if you're going to memorize something, okay, you say, weird condition, I'm a little bit confused, relax. You just say, there's something called chronic constrictive pericarditis. TB tends to be one of the most common causes worldwide. And you get something called Kussmaul sign, which is... Uh, the JVD goes up with inspiration rather than expiration. So when you have inspiration, you should have you should facilitate right heart filling. You shouldn't get impaired right heart filling. So JVD reflects impaired right heart filling, which is the opposite of what you'd expect when you have inspiration. So the thought is that when you have that rigid pericardial sac, that the right heart can't fill, and so that's going to lead to uh, cuss small sign where you can your JVP jugular weight venous pressure can be no change or go up uh, when you do inspiration. Okay, so just know that that's a finding. You don't have to obsess over the mechanisms. I'm just telling you that if you see it in a vignette, we're talking about what's going to get you points in the USMLA, right? So if they say that guy has history of tuberculosis, then when he inspires, J uh, JVP increases. You're like, well, that's chronic constrictive pericarditis. And I'll compare it to tamponade in a second. Okay, so tamponade equals pericardial effusion plus low blood pressure. Okay, so what determines whether you have a tamponade or not is not the volume of the fluid, it's the rate at which it accumulates. Stab wound to the heart, uh, and you get a fast accumulation of blood around the heart, even if it's lower volume, that can cause a tamponade, whereas a slow accumulation, let's say chylus, lymph lymphatic fluid over many months for due to EG cancer, that might not cause a tamponade. So basically all questions are going to be back triad where hypotension, JVD, muffled slash distant heart sounds. I'm just being clear that probably about four out of five questions will give you all three in the triad. I've seen an occasional question where they'll say hypotension, JVD, and they don't mention the heart sounds, but it's still obvious tamponade, okay? And then you got to be... so. When I explain this to students and I say, how does tamponade present? And they, they don't know. And I say, okay, it's going to be Beck triad plus or minus pulses paradoxes. So you're going to see a drop in systolic blood pressure greater than 10 millimeters of mercury with inspiration. They don't have to mention it in all vignettes. I would say maybe a quarter to a third of vignettes only will reference or mention pulses paradoxes as part of it. It's the Beck triad that shows up basically all questions, okay? Plus or minus pulses paradoxes. You don't have to worry about other causes of pulses paradoxes. Some students like to say, oh, but can't you see that in severe asthma, et cetera? US simply doesn't give a fuck, okay? So it's gonna be cardiac tamponade. 
And they can also call it paradoxical pulse on USMLE. If students, students get that wrong, um, they give you Bectrad, easy cardiac tamponade diagnosis. They say, what else can be seen in this patient? And the answer is paradoxical pulse, holy shit. Okay, they don't write pulses paradoxes. So, yeah, and as I wrote here in the presentation that there's a weird 2CK question floating around where they say in the vignette that the pulses paradoxus is under 10 millimeters of mercury, which I find weird because like, uh, the definition of pulses paradoxus itself is when you say it's a drop in stop blood pressure greater than 10 millimeters of mercury with inspiration. So I don't know why they word it like that, but I'm just letting you know that question's out there. So tamponade, you're going to see this electrical alternate slash low voltage QRS on the ECG. And verbally, you can have memorized that. You say, okay, I know I'm supposed to see that. But then the ECG looks like this, and you're not sure what you're looking at. This ECG shows up twice on two of the new NBME exams for 2CK, and you have to know it's cardiac tamponade, okay? And, and uh, pericardial effusion, for that matter, as well, okay? If you don't have low blood pressure, it's the same ECG. So uh, it's fair game for step one, but I'm just saying, you know, that's your ECG right there. And then if you're if they ask you to diagnose, you're obviously going to do the ECG first, followed by echo to confirm the fluid over the heart. And then this is where it gets a little bit tricky, is that, I would say maybe the majority of questions, when they ask about further management, they're going to go straight to pericardiocentesis slash pericardial window. There's an NBME question floating around on 2CK, offline NBME 8, where pericardial window is the answer. Pericardiocentesis isn't listed. They don't list both at the same time, so don't worry. Uh, but this is where it gets annoying, is that there is a free 120 question. I believe it's free 120, okay, where the answer is echo. Uh, over pericardiocentesis is next best step. They don't ask about diagnosis. They just say next best step. The answer is echo. Uh, and then on the NBME exams, they have echo is wrong. They have pericardiocentesis. So the NBME doesn't even know what they fucking want. Okay. And then you look up online, well, does systolic blood pressure matter if it's under 80 or versus over 80? And it turns out it doesn't. Okay. So it's, uh, I believe they gave 70 as systolic in the 3120 question. The answer is still echo. So it's like, NBME doesn't even know what they want, and that's why no one gets a 300 on the USMLA. So, as I mentioned before, with the tamponade versus CCP, I would briefly mention just the cusmol is CCP, uh, chronic constrictive pericarditis, uh, but in tamponade, you don't see the cusmol sign, and it's probably because that rigid pericardium and chronic constrictive pericarditis, you just literally get impaired filling, period, uh, even with inspiration. So, the, so you have the JVD there with inspiration, but with tamponade, the fluid is able to move over the heart. So even with the inspiration, you're not going to get that full-on cusmol sign. So you can just, I guess, kind of take home that tamponade and CCP uh, both present with impaired filling, but CCP is a bit worse. That's probably how you can remember it in terms of its effect on JVD. Torsad de Puentes, okay? I had a student once who was who like lived in France and like I I, I can't say this, okay? Torsades, Torsades de Puentes doesn't really matter, does it? So TDP and then it's you got this sinusoidal waveform, okay? And uh, this is a, a dangerous arrhythmia because it has high risk of conversion uh, slash degeneration into ventricular fibrillation, which is fatal. And you got to know that drugs that prolong the QT in particular uh, can cause it, okay? And just drugs that are proarrhythmic. I talk about the QT in a second, actually, but just proarrhythmic drugs, quinidine, uh, which is a sodium channel blocker, ibutilide, so 1A for quinidine, ibutilide, a potassium channel blocker, type 3 antiarrhythmics. So I'd say in general, the sodium channel blockers and potassium channel blockers for USMLE, you can just know that those can cause torsades. And then for drugs that prolong QT, such as tricyclics, macrolides, antipsychotics, metoclopramide, okay, these all prolong QT intervals, these increase risk with torsades. If you're weak on pharmacology, I mean, you can go through my PDFs and my, uh, my pharmacology content. I have modules and stuff, but I'm just letting you know that for the moment. Give magnesium. It's an answer on one of the NBMEs if they ask you what you should do in torsades apart from discontinuing any causal agents. Peak T wave seen in hyperkalemia. All right, so it's pretty rare to for this to show up in USMLE, but it does on one of the forms. And so what you want to know, it's it's rare that they show you the ECG. It's high yield that you know verbally in a vignette what peaked T waves mean is what I'm intending to communicate. So 
if they give you a patient who has high potassium, 3.5 to 5 is normal. If they give you, let's say, potassium is 7, and they tell you there's ECG changes. They say QRS widening or uh, STT wave changes, anything like that, uh, PR changes, then you're going to give calcium first as the management is what they want. So calcium gluconate has always been classic, but holy shit, there's a 2C can BME where they have calcium chloride as the answer. It blew everyone's mind. It's like not calcium gluconate, which was what was harped on for years. Okay, but you can give either, just calcium. And hypokalemias flattened T waves, uh, plus or minus a U wave, holy shit. So that just means hypokalemia, know that it exists, okay? There's a question that, that is floating around where they have this. Um, and as I said, people get emotional about these like low yield things that show up, but the question doesn't rely on you knowing it uh, on an ECG to get it right. It, they can they can just say patient has anorexia slash bulimia, uh, where you the, the bigger picture concept is that you know the most common cause of death in those patients is hypokalemia causing arrhythmia. So if they give you someone who's been purging, right, and you know that vomiting causes hypo hypochloremic, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. I mean, how high yield is that for you as is right? It's exceed, it's passable. So if you know that, then you can infer that that's going to be hypokalemia causing the arrhythmia there. Delta wave, I mean, Wolf Parkinson, White syndrome. Okay, so you just, it's a re, it's a type of reentrant tachycardia, but you can get this, uh, this obscure upstroke of the QRS complex called a delta wave. It's pretty low yield. I'm just saying you know it exists. I mean, I say it's a high yield presentation, but there's a few elephants in the room where if you don't fucking mention them, like you got to at least chop them off, right? But you got to, yeah, this is what a delta wave is. So a slurred upstroke means Wolf Parkinson White. And then J wave shows up for hypo, uh, for hypothermia. Okay, so there's a question where they just say the patient's body temperature is 89.6. And a lot of students overlook it. They're like, oh, I thought it said 98.6. Okay. But they say that there's a J wave in the vignette. They don't give you the ECG. Okay, you don't need to be able to identify an ECG. You just say they said J wave in the vignette. That's hypothermia, and the patient's body temperature is clearly low. First degree heart block. Okay, so prolonged prolonged PR interval greater than 200 milliseconds should be normally 80 to 120. And so you can see prior to the QRSs here, this PR interval looks really long. All right, this PR segment at least. So. And it's just due to uh, partial AV node malconduction. So you just got to be able to look at an ECG and know that that's first degree heart block. Secondary degree heart block has two types, Mobitz 1, Mobitz 2. Mobitz 1 is also known as Wenke back. Now Mobitz 1 is gradually prolonging PR interval until the QRS drops. Okay, so that's what happens here. And it's also due to AV node malconduction. You don't have to treat it in US simile, but you got to know the ECG. Mobitz 2, this one's more dangerous. So this is, you see that how there is no gradual prolongation of the PR interval, and then it just randomly drops? Okay, well, this is reflective more distal disease, Hisperkinji fibers, if you're forced to choose. And Mobitz 2 can also present with patterns of the P waves to the QRSs of 2 to, two to 1 or 3 to 1. Okay, it shows up in one of the NBME exams where they can show you something that looks like this, and you're forced to choose. Is it first degree, Mobitz 1, Mobitz 2, third degree? And it's just Mobitz 2, okay? So it can have, it can be a random dropping, or it's going to be a 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1 type of scenario with P waves to QRSs. But regardless, you're not going to have a gradual prolongation of the PR interval the way you do with Mobitz 1. As I said, it's more dangerous than uh, Mobitz 1. And so you're going to treat Mobitz 2 with pacemaker, which, which is what you're also going to do with third degree, as I'll talk about right now. So third degree, the two things you're going to look for on the ECG is going to be how there is super far distance between the QRSs, okay? You see a CCG and you're like, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, I'm scared. Okay, well, it doesn't look like the QRSs are super far apart, okay? So uh, this is gonna be your 30 to 40 beats per minute ventricular escape rhythm. And then you'll also know that there, notice there's no relation between the P waves and the QRSs because you have a complete severance of the conduction between the atria and the ventricles at the AV node, okay? So the AV node is where it's fucked up. And then, uh, treatment is pacemaker. So Mobitz 2 and third degree, you're going to treat with pacemaker, whereas Mobitz 1 and uh, first degree, you don't have to treat with pacemaker. Okay, so that's our quick ECG presentation here. Could do a lengthy discussion, all little uh, points about ECGs, but we're trying to increase your score in USMLA, not just teach you nonsense that, you know, some hand-holding first day of med school.
All right, so you know the deal. I'm going to put out more content and subscribe to my channels, and that's it.